Good morning and welcome everybody to the fourth uh, seminar of this International Plant Breeding Seminar Series uh, for the fall 2022. We have the pleasure to have uh, Dr. Mariano Alvarez uh, talking about interpretable machine learning to improve performance in association, discovering and prediction, a uh, topic that um, is certainly very relevant for our uh, plant breeding community. And uh, Mariano is a co-founder of Avalo AI, and he holds a PhD in ecology and plant evolutionary biology from the University of uh, South Florida. He has done postdoctoral times at um, the Wesleyan University and Duke University. And Mariano is interested in how the environment and the genome interact to create um, interesting adaptive uh, phenotypes with a particular focus on uh, plasticity um, and how that can influence adaptive, adaptive, adaptive dynamics and evolutionary trajectories. Uh, he's also very interested in um, how to mitigate climate change and enable sustainable agriculture through the synergies between biology, informatics, and society. And I also included a few slides in the introductory video about sake and fermentation with rice, because he is very, we, we have discussed this with Mariano, he's very interested in the biology and genetics of microorganisms that are related to fermentation, just to remind him about that topic. I don't know if he's gonna address that topic, but just, uh, just as a side note. As before, um, please post your questions in the chat um, during the presentation or right after the presentations, and we will convey those questions to Mariano. And uh, we are recording this meeting and it will be available later on for, um, for you to listen again. Mariano, I'm gonna stop sharing here. Thank you for accepting this invitation and uh, the floor is yours. All right, thank you so much, Carlos. Of course, I have not forgotten uh, about the microbes. I saw the, uh, the sake fermentation in the intro video. That was a nice touch. <coughs> Okay, sorry, I'm just going to go full screen here. All right, thank you guys so much for coming. Uh, thank you, of course, to the man, the myth, Carlos Iglesias for hosting. Today, I just want to talk a little bit about some of the science that uh, drives what we do at Avalo, uh, and some of this will touch on some of my postdoctoral work, some of the work that we've done. Um, at Avalo, um, I'm going to try to focus on the, the methods, which I think are sort of broadly applicable, but I'm also happy to talk about some of the specific work that we're doing at Avalo with broccoli and strawberries and rice and all that good stuff. So just a little introduction uh, about me. Um, I, as Carlos mentioned, I'm an evolutionary biologist primarily by training. Uh, my primary research interests are phenotypic plasticity and genotype by environment interactions. Um, I've also been really interested in, in thinking about uh, plastic response as a complex trait, um, but I've also had a longstanding interest in machine learning and artificial intelligence in biological problems, which obviously has uh, spiraled into the startup that I am uh, working for and helping to run today. Uh, and of course, I've always worked on plants. Um, and they've been a really great model organism, but I'm also really excited to be able to work um, be able to work on plants because of the impact that they have in the real world. So uh, I think all good talks start out with like a big unanswerable question. So here's mine. Where does natural variation come from? So obviously we know that a lot of natural variation comes from the genome, which is uh, what uh, we as uh, plant breeders and, and plant biologists are used to working with. But variation comes also from the environment, and that is expressed most succinctly in the classic equation for um, trait variation, where variation in the trait is equal to variation in the genotype, variation in the environment, and the interaction between the two of those things. Um, and historically, uh, I have been most interested in that E part and that G by E part, because that's the component that represents uh, phenotypic plasticity. So, um, this equation, this sort of very simple equation of, of trait variance equals uh, genotype and environment is a pretty simple concept that has driven a lot of um, research and a lot of productivity in plant breeding 
and plant biology for the past, um, you know, 70 or more years. But I think this is kind of a deceptively simple concept because uh, this, this very simple equation has um, been expanded uh, over the years to encompass all of the new technologies that we use today. So for example, that G term, conceptually a genotype might, you might think of a genotype as a particular uh, variety that you're trialing, but in fact, G can be broken down into uh, many smaller Gs and those smaller Gs can represent uh, SNPs, can represent indels, can represent structural variants or any marker that you might be interested in. And each of those contribute independently perhaps or together to uh, variation in the trait. On the other side of the equation, we can also break down that E term into, uh, into many smaller E's. So environment, we often think of as simply an error term, something that we're controlling for when we're trying to measure genetic variation or trying to measure heritability. And in fact, E can be separated into uh, soil conditions, into temperature, into moisture. And each of those things is working separately and interactively to, to create the trait variants that we see in the field. <clears throat> and so I've been really interested in the interplay between this sort of complex G and this complex E, um, and particularly as it relates to phenotypic plasticity. So before I dive too deep, I just want to give a quick definition of plasticity. If you currently have a personal definition of phenotypic plasticity, I'm going to ask you really briefly to forget it. Um, so phenotypic plasticity in this talk will be defined as the ability of a single genotype to produce multiple phenotypes depending on the environment. So in this kind of toy example here, you can see that as the environment moves from yellow to blue, genotype one gets more pointy until it gets four points. Uh, but genotype two uh, stays round from the yellow environment to the blue environment. The, the ability of genotype one to become more pointy is phenotypic plasticity. And the fact that genotype one and genotype two have different responses is G by E inherently. So in my previous life as an academic, um, I focused primarily on plasticity and fluctuating environments. And we know that in shifting environments, genetics environments and the interaction between the two of them are all playing a role. And I won't go too deep into uh, what I was working on at Duke, but we were looking at plastic responses over generations and we were able to break that E term down into several smaller E terms and measure them independently. And what we found is that plasticity and genetic variation for plasticity um, had pretty dramatic effects on fitness. So in, the, in these two figures, these are two genotypes of Arabidopsis that we were looking at. The Y axis is um, fitness as measured by uh, total seed weight produced. And what I'll just mention here very briefly is that the different environmental cues that we tested um, when we broke E down into several different components had differing and, and oftentimes very dramatic effects on uh, fitness, sometimes uh, as much or more as uh, genetics itself. And so this was really interesting for me to study because I think the implications can be can be really, really broad and shifting because we know in shifting environments, all of these things are playing a role. Um, modeling modeling those changes can become pretty important. So in this figure um, on the right, uh, sorry, I actually should have changed this uh, citation, but in this figure on the right, this actually comes from um, uh, Moy uh, Exposito Alonso's recent uh, 2020 paper. Um, and this is looking at selection gradients uh, on uh, drought tolerance um, across the European range. And you can see that those color changes show that selection pressures are changing across the range. And what he was able to do in that paper is actually measure um, the degree of selection on each allele in the genome, um, which is really interesting because that allows us to find which um, genes are allowing uh, organisms to respond to this uh, seasonality, to this, to this precipitation gradient. So the possibility of finding really, you know, I think the punchline for, for plant breeding is that the possibility of being able to find really useful um, markers and targets and genes for, for environmental tolerance, both biotic and abiotic, um, 
the potential is there, um, but the modeling is actually becomes quite a challenge when you have very many loci contributing to your trait. I mean, we know, of course, that um, abiotic tolerance traits, for example, are, are, are probably more complicated than uh, disease resistance traits, which often tend to be, you know, just a few genes. <laughs> and so to do the work that we do in genetics, I think we often make a lot of simplifying assumptions in order to make our lives easy and to make our models work. So for example, we know inherently that complex traits um, are comprised of very many loci, um, but the models that we have don't necessarily analyze them that way. When you do, for example, a QTL study or when you do a genome-wide association study, the model that you use to look for the association between the allele and the trait of interest um, is often just looking at that single, you know, one marker at a time. Um, kinship, for example, can be complicated to understand and to disentangle. And so we make the simplifying assumption that, you know, the method that we have will, will, will correct for that um, in an obvious way. And that one type of correction will, will sort of do the trick for all of our different studies. You know, of course, we know that the effect of loci depends on the environment. And so, you know, as, as plant biologists and often plant breeders, we'll do different analyses in different environments to be able to control for that variation. And that makes it hard to translate the, the findings between the different analyses. And of course, we know that markers and loci are interacting with each other to create an outcome. But, uh, you know, I think for a long time, uh, epistasis has been kind of a, kind of a bad word. So we've we ignored it, but uh, it doesn't have to be like that. And, and if we do ignore all those things, we actually reduce our ability to find interesting outcomes. And I'm speaking from experience because this is like exactly what happened to me in my postdoc. Um, I was trying to map the genetics of a complex trait, which is in this case, uh, thermal plasticity. <clears throat> and I was working in a rhabdopsis and, you know, like we're in Arabidopsis, we have the most data ever. Like it's, if it's possible anywhere, it's gotta be possible in Arabidopsis. Um, but this Manhattan plot here on the bottom is actually the Manhattan plot that I came up with uh, when I was doing my, uh, when I was doing my postdoctoral work. Uh, if you're not used to looking at a Manhattan plot on the X axis is genomic position. On the Y axis is the negative log 10 P value. So when the dots go up in the air, they're more associated. And each of the colors is a different chromosome. And if you're used to looking at these, um, you will know uh, that this is a really uncompelling uh, Manhattan plot. And this basically is sort of nothing. Excuse me. Um, and there's a lot of reasons why that this, this Manhattan plot looks like it's nothing. Um, of course, I'm looking at a polygenic trait. I know that there's a lot of environmental variation involved. I know that the loci are pleiotropic. Um, and this trait, you know, does have a genetic basis, we think, but detecting that genetic basis becomes hard. And part of the reason why it's hard is all of the simplifying assumptions that we've made. So how can we, as biologists and as plant breeders and, and, and people looking to actually produce uh, something interesting, come up with a method that integrates what we know is, is going on in the genome, the complexity of the genome with the different environmental variables that we care about and that we see uh, matter in everyday life. So um, I was fortunate enough to have a really, really supportive postdoctoral advisor and we had funding for a little while. So she was kind of like, you know, go figure it out and let me know how it goes. Um, so I did, and I ended up uh, forming this really productive collaboration with the computer science department uh, at Duke, in particular, Cynthia Rudin, who is this amazing um, statistician and machine learning researcher. <clears throat> and machine learning is a really, uh, I think, interesting tool for this problem because it, in, in a lot of ways, it alleviates some of the problems that I've been talking about. Um, a single model, for example, can accommodate uh, many markers at the same time. Um, those models are much more robust to confounding from experimental error, from kinship, from unknown kinship. Um, we can even use models that can accommodate interactions between the loci if many loci are working together to create a particular outcome. That is possible to model accurately. And we have a lot of models to choose from. 
Um, the, the caveat here is that machine learning historically has primarily been used for predicting things uh, and not necessarily discovering things. Um, and that uh, is kind of the black box nature of machine learning. So I, I do wanna pause for a second for those of you who might uh, not be familiar with machine learning or if machine learning seems super nebulous. Um, it's actually pretty straightforward. So just to explain it very briefly, you can imagine in this uh, plot here that these are a bunch of uh, individual uh, lines that you have and they have a phenotype that's either red or blue. <laughs> A normal model might uh, just model the linear relationship, uh, just fit a standard regression line in here, um, and then try to you know, separate these things based on their phenotype, and that would be that. But a machine learning model um, tries again and again until uh, error in the model is minimized. So you might let the machine learning model run for a little while until it ends up with something like this, which is a more complex splinal relationship rather than a linear relationship, and it separates uh, the, the, the red ones from the blue ones a little bit better. And then you might let it run even longer and you might get something very complicated like this, which does a very good job of separating things. Uh, so this machine learning, a machine learning approach is basically just a process by which models are iteratively fit over and over again. You just keep fitting models until the error is minimized and you have a complex solution. Okay. Hmm. So to, to, to try to understand this sort of black box model that we're using, we turned to this uh, very recent field called interpretable machine learning. <clears throat> and interpretable machine learning tries to open up that black box and understand what the machines are learning in order to be able to do discovery in addition to prediction. And in particular, we use this concept called conditional model reliance, which was introduced by Cynthia and her colleagues in 2019 uh, in Nature Machine Intelligence. And this allows us to investigate the degree to which a feature in the model or a marker uh, is improving prediction conditional on all of the other uh, markers. So we can actually try to estimate the effect of a single marker while taking into account the action of all of the other complexity going on in the genome. And actually this concept is sort of actually really simple. So you can imagine, I'll, I'll just sort of walk through the math really briefly. You can imagine you have a trait and you have three markers for that trait. And together, those three markers, let's say, explain 0.82% uh, of the variance, where you have an R squared of 0.82. Um, one way you might try to uh, see how important marker one is, is by dropping it. Uh, from the model. Well, if you do that, you're actually changing the structure of the model, and so you uh, can't make a good comparison. But you could replace it with uh, something we'll call fake marker one. And fake marker one looks very similar to marker one, except it doesn't contain any of the unique information that marker one has. Uh, it only contains information from markers two and three. And if you do this comparison, you might get a new R squared of 0.8 rather than 0.82. <clears throat> and so intuitively, when you subtract uh, the uh, R squared from the first model from the R squared from the second model, what you're left with is 0.02, which represents the amount of information that is uniquely contained uh, within marker one. So that's the uh, exact amount of variance that marker one is explaining. And this is a really kind of simple but powerful tool that allows us to fit very, very complicated models um, to our data and still understand what, uh, what that model is learning and what is important. And in turn, that lets us find out which genes and loci are important for the traits that we care about in a way that isn't really possible with, uh, with normal analyses. And I can show you that here. So in this figure, um, again, this is a Manhattan plot. Um, on the top is the output of a sort of normal GWAS, a linear mixed model. Um, here, the underlying data is real. So this is chromosome 11 of the rice genome. There's about 400 varieties underneath this. Um, but the trait here is synthetic. So we've created kind of a fake trait, picked uh, fake causal uh, positions or fake uh, true markers. And uh, that allows us to compare how well we're doing um, in 
with some sort of ground truth. Uh, so on the top, you can see, again, it's very uncompelling. It's hard to see because all the dots are going up into the air. But on the bottom, uh, you can see that all of that um, background confounding and noise is compressed down to the zero lines. And these black dots that remain at the top um, are the genetic basis of this, uh, this synthetic complex trait. So this was kind of a, a, a cool discovery for us and kind of a cool science win. And it allows us to, it allowed us to investigate much more complicated traits um, than we would have been able to before. And we can compare it. Uh, I'll, I'll skip over this, but please uh, ask me a question if you're interested in this. But basically we were able to test the performance in a systematic way. And in general, uh, we do much, much better than traditional genome-wide association approaches. And in fact, we were actually, uh, we were able to validate this in Arabidopsis and find novel uh, genes for flowering time that uh, previously hadn't been discovered. And uh, for those of you guys who do work on Arabidopsis, you'll know that uh, Arabidopsis is exceptionally well studied and it's not very often you find uh, new genes for anything. Uh, but we wanted to take a step back and ask um, what else we could do with this. So you know, we are at Avalo are an agricultural genomics company. Um, obviously, finding the genetic basis of a trait is really cool. There's gene editing approaches we could take, but we wanted to develop something that was really useful to plant breeders as well. And so we sort of took a step back and looked at this graph. And what we realized is that if we were really good at finding the genetic basis of a complex trait, if the dots above the zero line here represented all of the variation that we needed, um, then we would have all the information we needed to make a good genomic selection. And maybe that would be um, less expensive to assay than, than genomic selection uh, usually costs. But in addition to that, we're actually dropping a lot of um, not helpful uh, information when we do this by, by removing the information from most of the genome and just retaining these markers that we think are really, really good and really, really predictive, we're going to actually have more ability to make good selections than if we aggregated the data from the whole genome because we're losing a lot of that confounding. So we decided to test that um, with some retrospective data from six different species. So <clears throat> the six different species are in the panels up at the top. Uh, each of the box plots represents a different, um, a different trait. Uh, on the left-hand side of each of the panels is the result of our method. Um, in the center is RRBLUP, which is a standard genomic. If you guys have done any genomic selection, like RRBLUP is like a pretty standard tool. I know there's like a bunch of different flavors of it, but I think this is sort of a, a generally good one. Um, and on the right is an elastic net, which is something that you would be much more likely to see in the human genetics world. Um, the first thing I just want to say is I'm really proud to report that in almost all cases, plant biologists are doing way better than the human biologists. Um, so I include this just so that I can continuously dunk on the human biologists. But most importantly, uh, you can see that um, the predictive power of our models um, is generally much higher uh, is always higher and, and, and generally much higher than the predictions that you're able to get um, using RRBLOP, which is the standard tool. And interestingly, we're making that prediction, that, that, that trait prediction and subsequent genomic selection um, with much, much less data than, than um, RRBLOP would normally require. So that was kind of a cool uh, feature that we were able to implement, and that's a tool that we're using now at Avala. And once we realized that we were able to make these predictions using only a small set of the genome, we were able to sort of think long and hard about what that meant for our own breeding programs. Um, because of course, the cost of genotyping is, is perennially a problem, particularly in some of the species that we're working on, which don't have um, you know, really good SNP chips, for example, already made. But by identifying the loci that we need, I think we're in a much better position to be able to use sequencing-based approaches to, uh, to, to assay these markers reliably, um, to reduce the cost of doing our genotyping. Um, and it also, it's really nice because with a sequencing-based approach, it's much more flexible going into the future. If we're able to measure a new trait next year, um, it's very simple for us to incorporate markers for that trait. 
uh, into our genotyping program. So, you know, in our case, um, <clears throat> to do our uh, marker discovery, we still start with whole genome sequencing. But from there, uh, once we identify variants that are useful to us, we're able to step down a little bit um, to low complexity sequencing or, or um, low pass sequencing. Um, we're, if we have targets that we are, are um, really confident about and we just want to focus on those, we can actually just take another step down to hybrid capture primer-based sequencing approaches. And these are running us, you know, anywhere between like four and nine dollars a sample. And so that's that's pretty good, I think. And of course, in turn, that allows us to uh, do genomic selection on a much broader uh, population than we would be able to otherwise. <clears throat> so I started this talk by talking about phenotypic plasticity in the environment. So, you know, what happened to that? Well, I think um, one thing that I'm the most excited about and one one of the original reasons we developed these models is again, because they're very, very flexible. And so in addition to incorporating all of those informative markers into um, our, our genomic selection, we could also have a really nice framework to be, in, be able to incorporate other types of data. Uh, the machine learning models are able to accommodate a lot of different data types in the same model. And so we've started now to knit in environmental information in the form of precipitation data, um, we can integrate uh, microbial data from the soil microbiome or from the leaf microbiome. And we can even incorporate other uh, molecular markers as well, uh, transcriptome data or DNA methylation data. They can all sit in the same model and they can all be useful in increasing um, our, the efficacy of our genomic selection efforts. <clears throat> so just uh, as a brief summary, and I think we'll probably have plenty of time for questions, um, new statistical methods, um, particularly ones based in machine learning, can really dramatically increase the power of genome scans um, to detect uh, the genetic basis of complex traits of interest. And um, in particular, I think one thing I'm really excited about that I didn't that I didn't touch on as much is that the the, the rates of false discovery are really really low, um, and that I think is. You know, another way of saying that is that our markers are very, very close to the causal variant and are very unlikely to break in the future and are also much more informative. <clears throat> this provides us with a really nice framework to integrate other types of data, including environmental data. Um, I'm hopeful that even though I'm not in evolutionary biology, it becomes a really important tool to study plasticity in natural populations. And of course, now we're using this to study uh, complex traits, including phenotypic plasticity in, um, in domesticated populations. And then finally, this is uh, kind of our newest thing, so I didn't put a bullet point on here, but um, we're also able to use this technology to uh, reduce the cost of, of genotyping, I think, uh, by a pretty fair margin while, while increasing our uh, power to do genomic selection. <clears throat> so I just wanted to give a quick plug um, if you are uh, currently uh, interested in helping to test these methods, if you're interested in collaborating on a manuscript, if you would like us to, you know, take a look at some of your data and run it and you want to publish it, um, please get in touch. Uh, if you're studying the genetic basis of complex traits from a more uh, basic science perspective, please get in touch with us. If you would just like to come to our office at RTP and check out our greenhouses and have a beer sometime, please get in touch. Uh, and so with that, I would just like to thank all of the people who have helped uh, make Avalo possible. Uh, special thanks to my co-founder, Brendan Collins, and of course, to Carlos Iglesias, who puts on an awesome seminar. And I am uh, really happy to take questions. Thank you guys so much for your time. Thank you, Mariano. Thank you. Um, you want to stop sharing? Uh, yes. We already have um, one question uh, or a couple of questions. Jim Holland said, just want to clarify for a student that G by E variance uh, is not the product of B, uh, G, and V, E. Mm. You can read that in the chat there. Yes. Um, yeah. <clears throat> yeah, absolutely. Sorry, I, I would, I'm happy to clarify that. Uh, I was using the X just as a uh, notation tool here uh, to denote an interaction, but uh, 
Thank you, Jim. Uh, VG is, uh, G by E is not the product of, of VG and VE. It's, uh, uh, I think about it a lot as the interaction of, of genotype and environment. And I think there's a few different ways to conceptualize that, which I'm super happy to talk about. Just at the uh, end of the chat line there, uh, Jim is encouraging you to enter the maze G by E prediction competition. Um, I believe there's, what is, uh, what is the price, um, Jim? If, uh, can we open the mic, uh, Brendan? Is it, is it money or just recognition involved on that? Jim, can you speak? Or you know? Anyway. So I'll just uh, mention really quickly, we got a chance actually to, I, I just saw um, a tweet about the maze uh, G by E prediction competition for 2022. I think there is a, a, a small cash prize, which is pretty yeah. cool. It's four, it's 4,000, 4, which, yeah. which I know to Mariano probably doesn't matter, but for all the other students, <laughs> out there, you know, that, oh. that could be life or death, right? So yeah, but, but I think really what we're trying to encourage is people who are trying, you know, a lot of people have lots of different ways of doing prediction and, and analyzing data. And it's, you know, it's just gonna be fun to see how these things um, mm -hmm. uh, compete with each other. So that, that's why I just think it would be a nice thing. And you know, if, if you enter that thing and you win it, then I, I think you would, it probably would help your business. Right. Yeah, <laughs> yeah. Yeah. yeah, no, I mean, I think um, I, I, I totally agree. Thanks so much for, for, for mentioning it. <clears throat> mm -hmm. You know, I think um, we, there's there's two things I want to mention. The first is I think we um, are an academic spin out company, um, and I think we are um, fairly deliberately a science first company, and so we try to make um, as open as possible our results and our methods, and 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 try to promote the use of them in as broad an audience as possible. Um, and the the sort of second thing is I think the the organizers of uh, the the maize G by E prediction competition. And also I, I maize genomes to fields, uh, that data set before this has been like a really incredible resource to be able to benchmark a lot of these methods. Um, and it's been really nice to be able to, you know, see in, in, in sort of real life on a standardized data set, how all of these methods are performing. So we will definitely be uh, working on that data set. I know that companies are not eligible for the prize, which is okay. I think it should go to a very deserving graduate student. Um, but we are more than happy to share um, how our models perform on that. And we're really looking forward to digging into it. Thank you, Mariano. Uh, Ashwini is asking if the Avalo, Avalo um, model is a machine learning based model for GWAS and genomic selection. If you can clarify that. Yeah, yeah, yeah. So that's uh, really how we think about it. Um, we, the problem setup that we do right now is basically a GWAS setup. So if you have a variety trial or a GWAS panel, um, the same model that does uh, the GWAS is also the model that will do the genomic selection and both of those tend to perform very well. And so it's really nice to be able to work in an integrated framework um, to be able to do both of those, I think, pretty common tasks. Mm -hmm. Um, Sandeep is asking if, uh, have you tested the Avalo uh, machine learning models for low heritability traits where most of the genomic selection models struggle? Yes. Uh, yeah, that's a really good question. Um, I think probably the short answer to that is I don't think we've had a systematic comparison in low heritability traits in particular, but one thing I will say is that um, we haven't had a lot of really good benchmarking data sets outside of some of the data that we've been able to generate. And I think low heritability traits is kind of an umbrella for that, that can mean a lot of different things. Um, one thing I'll mention is that we have had a lot of success um, substantially increasing um, R squared and, and, and genomic selection efficiency when we are able to increase the number of markers in this in the panel. So there's a pretty strong correlation between initially when we train the model, how many markers are assayed uh, and are R squared. And the more markers that are assayed, the closer we're able to get to the causal variant. And so you can see the relationship between um, between the number of markers and our and our accuracy. So um, I will say that that there have been some traits that have been had pretty marginal um, 
genomic selection that that where the R squareds have been kind of marginal, and we've been able to increase those R squareds by a pretty good uh, margin in our method. Maybe related to that, Mariano, what about the minimal population size that you're looking for? Yeah, that's a really good question. I, you know, I think these are like the operational questions, probably the plague, uh, um, like plant breeders the most. Uh, I, I have to say we're still figuring out what a good population size is to start with. Um, the data, obviously, some of the the, the benchmarking data that I shared was um, greater than than two hundred individuals. We have just started to test. Uh, the lowest we've done, I think, systematically is one hundred and sixty five. Um, genotypes to start with. Um, we're testing lower than that now. Um, but yeah, that's a that's a really good open question. Okay. Uh, Roshan is asking that he's curious why more loci lows don't get highlighted by your approach um, just by association due to linkage to this equilibrium. Is this maybe a proprietary uh, information <laughs> from poor Balo? Uh, Roshan, it is not proprietary. Uh, this is actually a really interesting, sorry to dig into the weeds a little bit, this is actually a really interesting um, point. Um, so we, yeah, so normally in uh, genomic, in genome-wide association studies, you see these very characteristic peaks due to linkage disequilibrium where all of these loci um, are associated uh, together. And it's um, a little counterintuitive, right? Because when you see a very strong signal, the stronger that signal, the broader the base of the peak becomes because all of those loci are getting um, uh, are, are being associated uh, just due to LD. And what that means in practice, I think, is that your search space becomes that entire peak from the entire base of that peak. Um, because you know, often the lead SNP in that peak is not actually the causal variant. So um, one kind of nice property about the models that we use is um, that uh, peak. Um, we're able to use the information captured in LD and that gradient of association to uh, to actually hone in on the variant that we think is most likely to be causal. And then all of the rest of those uh, linked associations are dropped. So actually, when you see those points, what you're actually seeing is like the most likely causal variant within a very strong peak. Um, so yeah, that that is the answer for why that looks so sparse. Any other questions um, that we can want to post to Mariano? Thank you so much, Mariano. And again, uh, he's inviting anybody that would like to uh, continue this conversation. Uh, maybe uh, Mariano, you want to post uh, the website. Oh, the, the website. The, your email is there. Okay. Yep, my email is there. Uh, please feel free to check out our website. Please feel free to send us. Um, email. Uh, my inbox is always open if anybody has any questions uh, or would like to collaborate. And yeah, thank you guys so much for your interest and your time. Okay. Thank you, Mariano. Um, for next week, we have a seminar by Dr. David Marshall uh, from uh, formerly James Trafton Institute. He retired last year, I understand, but he's still emeritus there. Uh, so it's not actually formally. So um, seeing is believing data visualization in genetics and breathing. He's actually the author of several uh, methodologies that are uh, regularly used in, in, in genomics. So it'd be a, a, an interesting uh, talk. I know I have known David for several years and he's a very interesting uh, fellow to listen to. Uh, that will be next Thursday at uh, 11 a.m. same time. So I uh, look forward to uh, having you again attend. Uh, again, this, the recording of this, um, the link for the recording for this seminar will go with the announcement of next seminar. If you scroll down that announcement, you will see the recordings to previous seminars, okay? Thank you, Brandon and Tiago for your help and, and organizing and putting together this seminar. Thanks again, Mariano, for uh, kindly accepting the invitation to, to talk to us today. You guys have a good rest of the week and I'll see you next week. Thank you so much.